Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Moon. I am your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I'm joined by my wonderful co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. He is back, um, and today we are interviewing Edward Evanson, uh, head of business development at Brains, uh, a Bitcoin uh, mining company uh, known for the world's first Bitcoin mining pool uh, slush pool. Um, so, Edward, I know you had uh, COVID uh, not long ago. Uh, how are you feeling now? You all recovered? Yeah, um, you must uh, you must follow my Twitter. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling much much better now. It hit me pretty hard for like two to three days but after that i was fine just staying inside until it was officially negative and now life's back to normal all good gotcha nice glad to hear it yeah i had it over christmas so i know the same feeling of like being stuck there you feel like you're in a box very aggravating but uh good to hear you're all good um and yeah thanks for coming on i um i guess first question to kick us off uh when it comes to uh, you and uh, Bitcoin. What is your what's your kind of uh, origin story? What were you doing before Bitcoin, and how did you find it? And then, like, what was it about Bitcoin that kind of uh, appealed to you? Like, because obviously different things for different people. Yeah, for sure. Um, so before Bitcoin, um, I was getting my I was a PhD student in uh, history with a focus on economics, um, history of money, uh, international markets. Um, lecturing some courses, uh, being a TA in some courses, things like that, as well as doing their own research and courses. And uh, naturally, because of those topics, I was already interested in um, something like Bitcoin. This new form of money had appeared, and it was always something that interested me. Um, I think when I first heard about it, it was from a friend in undergrad in like 2012, but I didn't really look much into it at that point. I kind of just shrugged it off as like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> and um, I started getting like actually into it and researching it and figuring out what Bitcoin was all about um, in 2016. And then I, at that time, late 2016, realized that I didn't want to be a professor, which is what I thought my, the original track I was on. And so I dropped out and moved to China. And from there, sort of dove, um, you know, full time into uh Bitcoin and the Bitcoin mining world um, uh, was working in China for about two and a half, three years based out of uh, Shanghai and Beijing. And then I moved to um, Prague in 2019 and started with brains then. So I've been, in, uh, I guess, in Bitcoin for uh, coming up on six years here almost or five and some change. But um, uh, I haven't been in Prague until 2019. So that's kind of how I got into it. Just some already, uh, was already interested in these topics. And uh, once it was kind of was placed in front of me in a more direct manner, I kind of just fell down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, the situation with like uh, being a professor and then um, deciding not to do it. I know someone who's going through the same thing. I get, so you had you, did you like decide to just leave it and just jump to China on a whim or was it more like you got like a role in Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin or I'm trying to work out what came first you know like was it oh yeah Bitcoin kind of started to take over as a thing and you realize you want to get involved then you head off to China or was it more like screw this I'm going on a find myself journey and then you ended up being like oh well I can do this anyway <laughs> um so I guess the best way to describe it is they kind of happened simultaneously, but I didn't, I didn't move to China specifically for Bitcoin related stuff. Um, I wish I had some grand plan that was executed perfectly, but I knew I was moving to China like three weeks before I actually did. Um, I had visited once before and then a friend and former roommate of mine at the time, who was my roommate in uh, undergrad some years before was already living in Shanghai. He said, come check out China in Shanghai. So I packed up my stuff. And then went over. It was uh, pretty simple. Nothing too planned. Were you involved in the famous Chinese mining uh, industry while you were in China? Or did you get involved in mining afterwards, like when you went to Prague? Uh, while I was in China. Uh, mostly while I was in Beijing. Um, I worked at uh, F2 Pool when I was in Beijing. That's pretty interesting. It's like a, it's an interesting story. And I think... Um... Like heading to China, it's, it's got to be a bit of a culture shock. Um, uh, it, I imagine it's very different to the to the US uh, where you were studying and, and, and 
living. <laughs> um, I imagine anyway. Um, never been to China myself. Uh, I suppose when it comes to like, um, so you've experienced uh, mining in China and obviously now in uh, Czech Republic or Czech, I think I'm supposed to say. Um, what what are like the main, because something I've always been interested in is like what, what are the main things that people who are mining and and I suppose yeah anyone who's mining on like a sort of grand scale what are the what are the main challenges that they're facing because I I it's, it's kind of like a side of the world that I just don't really think about too much like I know how you mine I know how someone can set up their own like mining rig but like how how what are the actual issues that that these people are facing on a day to day basis because it's something that interests me is like what are the problems is it is it like cooling issues or what are the general things that you know people on the day to day are, are, are maintaining these yeah, so that's that's a pretty big question, and um, the main problems are going to differ depending on the kind of setup that they have, where they're mining, whether they're doing air cooled or immersion, the scale they're mining on, um, what the market is like at the time. You know, the problems miners faced a couple of years ago are very different than the problems they're generally facing today. So, in the short term, um, a big issue uh, the industry as a whole seem to be facing is. Um, Actually, maybe we can start with one that actually has sort of plagued the industry, you could say, for a long time now, and uh, kind of a bottleneck. Um, one of the more centralized parts of Bitcoin mining would be the hardware manufacturers. So basically, you're relying on, for the most part, two entities to supply you with uh, your Bitcoin mining devices, the biggest one being Bitmain and the second one being MicroBT. Um, so they have a lot of leverage and power, I guess, in negotiations between uh, themselves and their clients and um, basically are able to dictate prices and don't have a whole lot of competition. This is going to change um, in 2022 and 2023. Uh, it's, you know, there's a recent public announcement that Intel is getting into Bitcoin mining chips and they've already selected some, uh, some partners to be sort of the, uh, to receive the first batches of them. And um, so it's interesting that there's now a US chip producer throwing their hat into the ring and participating. And there are also some other miners that are mining at a scale of like hundreds of megawatts that are either buying chips from different sources or designing their own to create um, their own special mining setups. And so that they don't necessarily have to rely on one or two companies for their entire business, which is pretty untenable for any other industry, um, but that they, they are now mining on such a scale that it makes more sense to just start producing their own mining devices and not uh, for distribution or for sale, but just for their own operations. Um, so they get uh, basically the cost base is much lower. So, you know, maybe they're spending uh, 20 bucks per tera hash on their hash rate, as opposed to, you know, between 80 to hundred dollars per tera hash when you're trying to procure uh, machines from Bitmain or something right now. So um, that's something that's, uh, you know, the fact that there's only a, a few large suppliers of these Bitcoin mining devices has been an issue that miners, any miner will face, large or small. Um, more recently, there's some uh, chip shortages from the foundries where Bitmain and MicroBT procure the ASIC chips for their devices and the space for these uh, in these foundries to reserve chip production is becoming more and more scarce and a lot more people are kind of vying for it. So now uh, they have to compete more uh, pretty seriously with entities like Apple, um, car manufacturers, things like that, that are all hungry for, for chip production and trying to secure um, their supply for the years to come. Um, and then uh, I could go on for hours about just like the day-to-day -day operational challenges that different mining operations face. Um, you know, there's always delays in terms of like build outs to the infrastructure. And uh, because of the, China Chinese ban on mining back in summer of last year. Now, um, the a dynamic of the industry sort of flipped, whereas before there was kind of an overabundance of hosting space for miners. And so uh, hosting providers didn't necessarily enjoy the most favorable terms with their contracts with different miners who were hosting machines in their facilities. Um, but ever since the, the China ban, you know, uh, 40 to 50% of the network shut off at the time. And then you have this huge outflow of machines and um, there's all of a sudden it, it flipped and now there's an over demand for uh, the rack space. And people were still in the uh, you know early stages of large build outs to expand their capacity. So then they began to enjoy a much better position in the market now commanding things like profit share agreements, higher 
uh, prices per kilowatt hour. And um, so a, a challenge that miners have been facing the last, you know, two to three quarters uh, now is basically getting machines, but not necessarily having the space to put them on the shelf and turn them on. And so uh, a lot of it's kind of waiting for this new capacity to come on in places like uh, Texas, which is becoming increasingly popular in places like Paraguay, which has now a bunch of uh, abundant hydropower that can be used for Bitcoin mining. Argentina is heating up. Uh, Venezuela has always been a place for old gen machines to kind of travel to when other larger miners uh, replace their older generation machines with some of the newer, uh, newer generation ones. And so then they would sell these and eventually as they get old enough, they all kind of make their way to the dirt cheap electricity rates um, that you can find there. Uh, Kazakhstan started expanding. So yeah, that's kind of at, at the risk of uh, just going on forever rambling. I'll just cut it off there, but large and small people face many different challenges um, on the day to day. No, I appreciate that. Um, that kind of answers my question pretty well um and i've got bad signals so sorry if, you, if i do cut out again but um i saw about the kazakhstan situation uh where they have um uh what's it, big protests and like uh, shutdowns of the internet and electricity and all sorts of things like that it feels like with mining miners are almost playing a game of cat and mouse a lot of the time like chasing the cheap electricity but also trying to get away from instability and uh, governments that aren't a fan of them and so like the things like um, the Kazakhstan issue and then things like I think it's the EU is talking about the regulators talking about trying to ban uh, crypto mining in general although I think they're mainly talking about Bitcoin mining and proof of work um, these kinds of things I guess is there like obviously you're someone in the mining industry is there is there concern I guess around this like with a lot of mining companies or are they more so kind of happy like yeah look we're in Texas we're going to be good or we're in Venezuela we'll just keep going after the, the the good the good or the sources of electricity i think it's like is it something that generally seems to concern these, these people who are, who are doing the mining or is it not really a big deal to them when they hear this stuff about like the eu and, and then the Kazakhstan? i think it's something that's always in the back of their minds um naturally when you know heads of state or people in political power are speaking about you know creating a moratorium or a ban on your industry it's going to concern you to some extent um, however, it's about assessing different risk profiles, just like with any other investment. Um, the, you know, if, you, if you're going to a place like Kazakhstan, like Venezuela, or some of these places where uh, authority is, you know, arguably more dictatorial and centralized, and things can change at the drop of a hat, um, you're going to weigh that trade off with the cheaper electricity prices in these places. Um, however, this, you know, for people with low risk appetites, this is one of the reasons why Canada and the United States are so attractive because generally they've always had a pretty stable regulatory environment. You can see things coming from very far out and you can thus try to intervene and protect your own interests um, in the legislative process. And then also the United States, a lot of people seem to overlook this, um, have the advantage of it being a set of United States, right? So you have the federal government and then the local state governments. And in places like Texas, Wyoming, Ohio, Kentucky, you already have a significant amount of investment and job creation in those areas from Bitcoin mining. You have the governor, Governor Abbott of Texas, um, kind of fully on board to Bitcoin mining as a growing industry within Texas borders. And, you know, when you create this level of investment, new jobs, and you can see how quickly the industry going is, is growing, and you can demonstrate to these uh, political representatives in the region that, you know, there's, there's a lot more potential growth to come and benefits to the state then um, you have people in your corner, you have people on your side, you have uh, senators like Loomis, um, you have, uh, um, say Abbott, there's, I um, can't, can't remember her last name, I think it's Caitlin Long, um, who is now, I think, left her office seat and gone to a, a private like uh, cryptocurrency bank in Wyoming. And these are now uh, Brian Brooks, who is now working for, for Bitfury as the CEO in the US. So you, you have uh, now a, a set of people who are politically skilled in terms of like knowing the right channels and avenues and how to lobby for um, these interests uh, before congressional hearings, um, state hearings, what have you. So it's a longer process and there's uh, open avenues that you can use to kind of protect Bitcoin mining. There's not as much of a risk of just, you know, uh, Congress stepping in and saying, hey, we're doing a 
federal ban on Bitcoin mining. Um, it's not nearly as as easy to pull off as other uh, states like in Kazakhstan, where um, people can essentially decide something one day and it comes into reality the next. We recently interviewed Ricardo Frega, the host of the Bitcoin Italia podcast, and he visited the volcano mining operation that's in El Salvador. And he actually spoke to the technicians working at the geothermal energy plant and asked them their opinion on Bitcoin mining um, in light of the, the narrative that uh, Bitcoin mining is like using up all the world's resources and stuff. And those technicians seem to be super excited about the prospect of being able to harvest and store this energy with Bitcoin. And, and they claim it's going to revolutionize energy for like the next hundred years. Um, what's your opinion on the, on this, um, this narrative that Bitcoin's going to boil the oceans and all that? Uh, it's just patently false and just ridiculous. And to the largest degree, um, you know, there were some articles coming out in 2017. I think it was from Newsweek, it was originally, or um, I can't remember the exact source, but they were saying that basically now in 2022, that Bitcoin would be consuming the, all of the world's energy, um, you know, boiling the oceans meme. And we can see that that's not the case. It consumes, um, I think it's like it's 0.2, 0.25 or something percent of like global electricity consumption. And people, Something I really don't like about the narrative, this like sort of uh, environmentalist, like anti-Bitcoin approach, is that uh, everyone talks about it in terms of energy consumption, as if energy consumption is the same as emissions. It's just not the case at all. Uh, before the Chinese ban on Bitcoin mining, the vast, vast majority of the hash rate for the majority of the year was coming out of Sichuan, and they were taking advantage of hydropower. Um, sure, Xinjiang, of course, if you're just being honest, like they use coal power up in the north, but for the majority of the year, most of the hash rate was coming out of Sichuan. And they have an overabundance of hydropower there because they've built up so many hydro um, uh, plants around these rivers and dams. And a lot of these things aren't even actually near population centers. So they're just, they just go to waste. There's, there's all this accessible energy that's not being used. It's renewable and it's cheap. So they were, being, they were taking advantage of sources like that. And even since China has banned it, right? Um, a lot of the sources you look at in the U.S. are hydro, as in Canada as well. Um, you have, uh, you know, these um, off-grid mining operations that reduce um, gas venting and oil flaring, uh, where you know the efficiency can be as low as thirty percent, and actually, you know, reducing that CO two that comes out of some of these flares. And instead of like flaring all this stuff or like venting it to the atmosphere, uh, you can plop down a generator next to it converted it into electricity and mine Bitcoin with it, you reduce emissions significantly uh, and you are able to take advantage of energy that's already available, um, but can't be transported anywhere effectively. That is stranded energy. Um, you know, when you look at the, some of the research that's coming out from the Cambridge Institute of Alternative Finance, um, you know, some of the stuff the, the Bitcoin Mining Council is doing in, in North America in terms of disclosing their energy mix, uh, the new projects that are coming up, like the the, one, the world's like largest hydro dam in Paraguay. It, I think it has like 14 gigawatt capacity. Most of it's sent to Brazil, um, but uh, there's still, I think, like 20 to 30 percent available for Paraguay. Um, you know, the, the energy mix of, of Bitcoin mining is more green than any other in, uh, industry that I can think of off the top of my head. And it, it just also, like on a final note, so I don't go on too long, it all just seems so hypocritical, right? Like Bitcoin mining doesn't happen in a vacuum. You should compare it like relative to other industries. You know, where is this Where is this uprising about gold mining? Like where's where is the, the shouting about the lithium uh, mining that like, you know, Tesla is, is subsidizing so much for its car batteries. That is literally the most destructive form of mining. And, um, you know, where's the, the, the outcry of like the, the solar panels coming out of China that uses like Uyghur labor. I, I don't, um, it just seems so hypocritical, uh, misinformed and just patently false in many cases. So that's basically what I think of the boils of the ocean. Uh, narrative, and I think it's going to be a um, really important moving forward, especially in the next couple of years, to push back against some of these regulatory proposals to uh, to like basically shut down proof of work as much as possible, and do it with data, um, do it with the truth, do it with you know disclosures of energy mixes, um, good research that shows that 
this this narrative that mainstream media outlets are pushing is um in the nicest way to put bullshit 